Greetings, everybody. We are here today to, as part of Total Health Conferencing's virtual year in review. These are, um, I'm joined with my fellow um, patient advocacy um, organizations. Um, we're going to talk today about how COVID has really transformed the work that we do. <clears throat> um, I'll start off with introductions. I am Erica Terry. I'm CEO of Susan G. Komen, Kansas and Western Missouri um, affiliate. Um, and I'll, we represent the entire state of Kansas as well as seven counties in Western Missouri and have um, hopefully used um, COVID as a opportunity to really transform the work that we do for the coming year. And I'm excited to dive into the conversation with each of you. Um, I'll kind of go around our Zoom and um, I'd ask each of you to offer uh, brief introductions. Annette, let's start with you. Thank you, Erica. Um, my name is Annette Iyer. I'm the National Assistant Vice President of Patient Engagement for the American Lung Association. Um, we are one nationwide organization. We did a, a merger about two and a half years ago. So we're um, very excited to be a part of this conversation. And as with you, I, I believe that our organization continues to meet the efforts of um, lung disease patients um, through this COVID-19 pandemic through um, fine-tuning our virtual skills. <laughs> Absolutely. Michael. Uh, thank you, Erica. Great to meet you, Annette. Uh, Michael Sepienza. I'm the CEO of the Colorectal Cancer Alliance uh, here in Washington, D.C. And uh, us too, I think we've had quite, quite the year and meeting the needs of, of patients and their families, and specifically for colorectal cancer. It's around the, the screening piece, so look forward to chatting today. Fantastic. Brian. Yes. Hi. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Erica. Thanks for this opportunity. Uh, I'm Brian Lewis. I'm the president of Kidney Can. We're the voice of the kidney cancer community um, on Capitol Hill, and we work with a, no a number of other kidney cancer organizations. And our focus is on uh, trying to increase funding for research for kidney cancer. So I'm glad to be here today. Thank you for having me. Well, I, um, we only have 30 minutes today, but I anticipate we could probably talk for 24 hours and share um, lessons learned and best practices now. But let's just dive in um, initially speaking um, and share um, each of us how COVID has really impacted the work that we do in the populations that we serve. Um, Brian, why don't you start us off? Sure, sure. Thanks, Erica. So um, Kidney Cans had two sort of major shifts this year due to the COVID pandemic. Um, uh, first of all, you know, we started gathering information from patients that we were hearing from and trying to just collate that as well as we could just and try to give advice and try to act as an intermediary. We're a big fan of smart patients out there um, and try to get patients talking to one another and to, to professionals. Um, but, we're, um, but our focus on Capitol Hill had to shift because we had just finished the spring advocacy days and then we had to pivot for what, what are we going to do next. And so we created a district days event, and I'd be happy to talk about that, we, where we um, gathered folks from around the country and had House and Senate video and phone calls um, to, to press our points and make our asks on Capitol Hill. That was one big pivot. Uh, it was successful in August uh, where when uh, representatives were at home at their district offices. Um, and then secondly, we, we've had, we have a big summit coming up next week where we brought together some DOD, Department of Defense awardees under the K Kidney Cancer Research Program. We've had to turn that meeting into a virtual meeting. Last year, it was here, held here in Philadelphia. Uh, so uh, that's just a quick synopsis of some of the things we've been doing. Fantastic. Michael. Sorry, I have to remember to unmute myself. Um, yeah, I, th I think, uh, you know, from the beginning of the pandemic, it was, you know, where are our patients and where are their families, you know, and, and what do they need and what has changed since last week or the week before, et cetera. And so I think, you know, those first couple of weeks were really like, wow, like, uh, you know, patients are not even knowing, you know, should they go in for their scan? Should they go in for their treatments? Are they getting um, in-person in uh, appointments? What is being canceled? What is being rescheduled? So a lot of our work that, that first month was really kind of figuring out what was really going on and just um, increasing our helpline hours, increasing the number of navigators we had talking to people and really just making sure people felt like that they, they weren't alone um, you know, during, during that time. And it certainly was a discovery phase for us, I think just like it was for patients and their families and not really knowing what exactly was happening. And then I think just the fear of, wow, this is like a pandemic and how long is it gonna go on and what does it mean for both internal organization but also the external stakeholders that we serve. 
Um, and I mentioned before, you know, specifically screening for colorectal cancer. So it was mainly breast, cervical, colorectal um, screenings had really taken a drastic hit in March and April and May, and they still continue to be down about 30% nationwide, which you know, it was really, really unfortunate because for us, it means, you know, more missed and delayed diagnoses. And it also means, you know, unfortunately, you know, more people will, will pass from this disease over the course of the next five to 10 years. So we've really been trying to uh, counteract that. We've just actually this week launched a public awareness campaign for screening during COVID. Um, and then we've launched a navigation website so patients can, you know, both, you know, take advantage of take home, take at home test at home test and the colonoscopy. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, um, I'll share um, similarly in the breast world, um, you know, initially seeing the initial data of how drastically screenings decline um, during COVID, which we know was the right thing to do at the moment, but there's huge ramifications related to that um, down the road. And I'm sure all of you saw um, the piece that um, Ned Sharpless, director of the National Cancer Institute wrote about the, um, uh, the new public health crisis we're about to face as a result of COVID um, with upwards of projecting 10,000 uh, breast and colorectal cancer deaths over the next decade if we do, no, do not get back to getting screenings. And so that that's a very scary statistic. And I'm thankful to hear that your organization is proactively working to you know, address that and address people's concerns about getting back into the clinic. Annette, talk a little bit more about how COVID's impacted the American Lung, Lung Association. Yeah, um, you know, we did have um, our uh, Lung Force Advocacy Day, which was an event that we brought a um, hero, a lung, a lung cancer patient from every state, including the district, all 50 states and including the District of Columbia to Washington, D.C. Um, that was supposed to happen March 20, like March 21st. So obviously that was really the week that the pandemic really um, restrictions went into effect. So, of course, the health and safety of, of, of our lung cancer patients and our staff, you know, we did a quick pivot to do um, a, a virtual advocacy day, which, you know, we're so amazed at the resiliency of our patients because, you know, it is a challenge to do Zoom calls and, and now we're a lot better, but back then, you know, it was a really good um, pivot. And, you know, we did, we had 115 participants, we made 172 calls. And, you know, what we found um, through this advocacy day more than others was that, um, you know, we had over 50 congressmen on the phone, you know, on the phone with the patients. They were more, we felt like they were more engaged. They definitely were very interested and they wanted to, to not only talk about COVID, but they understood COVID was the underlying conversation, but they respected our wishes and wanting to talk about patients with pre-existing condi conditions and also funding for, um, with the National Institutes of Health for Lung Cancer Research. So we felt a, a better engagement through this virtual piece. Um, and we also have found that with, um, through this pandemic, I mean, so much of the conversations, it, picking up the phone and calling patients, which we all need to do a better job of, you know, of actually just going through your old, your, your virtual Rolodex and calling people. And we did that. We, we called several, um, you know, several hundred um, lung cancer and lung disease patients just to check in to see how they were doing, because we understand that this was a very trying time and social distancing was something that needed to be done, but it also made them feel very lonely and isolated. Um, we definitely, you know, continue to make sure that, um, you know, millions of Americans have lost their health insurance because of losing their job during the pandemic. And we're trying to really um, gear up our efforts to, to educate people on the importance of open enrollment when that happens and what to look for and what to ask your, you know, what to become edu become more educated on what to look for for health plans. So we're continuing to work with our patients and they are helping us be better at, at the virtual and, and really getting feedback of what they want to hear and what they need. And so we've been doing a lot with that um, through our um, online support communities and our helplines. Before we move on to the next question, I'm curious um, if you each wouldn't mind, and this wasn't on the list of questions, so, but it, it, it speaks to um, how, um, how COVID has impacted your revenue um, as, uh, you know, for impact organizations that rely on um, public support um, 
very generous public support for the work that we do. Um, I'm not a firm believer in, um, you know, your revenue drives your impact or no mission or no mission, no money. I'm a believer that your impact drives your revenue. And so, you know, the work that we do is still significant and is probably being proven to be more important now than ever as a result of a global pandemic. How has revenue and how have you creatively tried to figure out new revenue streams for the work to support the work that you are doing? Ryan. Yeah, put me on the spot. Well, we're a young organization. We're, we're, we're a young organization. So I'm, I, I think that Annette might be able to speak more, you know, to a, a large organization. Um, we've been um, slightly up this year. Um, we and I think that's because of some of the pivoting. Um, with the, we created the district days, like you know the fly-in that Annette said when we went, they went virtual, um, and that was a new project. So that was uh, revenue from both uh, private and industry partners, um, as well as when with our virtual meeting that was coming up, uh, we um, added some pieces to it. We actually created a CME around it um, for the first time. And so, you know, we've been creative like others. And so we're, we're doing okay. We can't complain. Um, I know, uh, you know, uh, excuse me, another number of organizations, <laughs> excuse me, a number of organizations are having a hard time, but we're doing okay. Thank you. That's fantastic to hear. Michael. Yeah, so uh, I think it's a double-edged sword. I mean, certainly we had a 20 walks across the country that had to go virtual. We had a whole gala series that called a Blue Hope Bash where we have in six different cities that's had to go virtual. Um, and that's makes up about four to five million dollars of our revenue. So we certainly take have taken probably about a 50 to 60% cut in that revenue, but it has allowed us in other, other areas. So our major donors have stepped up big time. Our foundation donors have stepped up big time. Our corporate and industry partners have stepped up big time. And, you know, as I mentioned, there's, there was the opportunity around the screening piece. A lot of these companies, their revenue has dropped significantly and they wanted to invest in, in, in people getting back to get screened. And, and some of our major donors, this has given them a, a, some time to kind of slow down a little bit and have a little bit more time um, to really plan. And we, you know, have secured two $7 million gifts over the course of the last month. So, I mean, all in all, uh, it looks like we may end up around the same as what we budgeted, just a kind of a different, different lanes of revenue that make up that, that total. Congratulations. That's incredible to hear. I mean, we need people uh, supporting our efforts and the work that we do probably more so now than ever before. Mm -hmm. Annette. Great, thank you. Well, you know, as with any organizations, and as both Michael and Brian said, you know, we, uh, you know, our fundraising efforts, our walks, our fight for air climbs, and um, our galas, you know, they're critical to the work that we do. Um, but you know, the the Lung Association has been guided by very smart and fiscally prudent um, leadership, and it definitely has um, had an effect, you know, on some of the things that. Um, our events and our fundraising capacity. But as, as, as Michael and Brian also mentioned, you know, we do a lot of work um, around um, patient access and, and protecting patients with pre-existing conditions. And so we're able to, to be um, creative and we do have a lot of private sponsors and, um, you know, industry sponsors that um, support the work that we do and really are embracing it. So I think it's, it's making us, um, if anything, I think we have created more learning opportunities, more engagement opportunities for lung disease patients um, nationwide to really, you know, know at the heart of what we do and, and our really our mission is to um, save lives and, and eradicate lung disease. So we're continuing to do that effort. So, you know, health and safety of our employees and our patients are and our volunteers are first and foremost. So we're going to continue to stay in this virtual mode until things are safe and until we're we're in a good place and, and continue to connect with them. Hey, Erica, if I could add to what Annette just said, um, one of the things, and this might be tangential to the, to the revenue question, but I've noticed, and maybe the others on this call have noticed that there's a more, there's more of a passion by the volunteers. There's more of a passion by the patients and caregivers that are in, engaged than there was, I think a year or so ago. I mean, there are people always passionate and engaged about their, these issues, but, and, and, but I, I think there's just some sort of like, we're in this now all together, let's do some more. So mm -hmm. I don't know, I don't, that's not scientific, but that's my perception. Yeah, and Erica, oh, I'm sorry. I was no, just, go ahead. 
Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, you know, to Annette and Brian's point, a little bit what I'm hearing, and I know what we focused on is, you know, when we when we when the pandemic first hit, we were like, well, yes, revenue is really important, and it certainly is going to, at some level, you know, drive how we can make an impact. But Annette, I think what you said is spot on. We talked to, I think, 800 of our donors within the first four weeks. That's all the development department did. We didn't ask anybody for money. And I said, I, you know, I said, yeah, we're gonna have to switch some of these things to virtual, but let's make it all about community. It is all about community because if, you know, this is gonna be over someday and our community will remember the way that we, we acted during this time. And I think that is so, so important. And it, it's giving them opportunities. Yes, if they wanna give, of course, that's important for us to continue to be able to serve them. but you know, just being able to be together, et cetera, is also important. So. Mm -hmm. Couldn't agree more. And it's, I think it's an interesting moment for us as, um, you know, leaders of organizations and uh, non, not for profit organizations where, whereby not that we weren't good stewards of the dollars before, but it's really focused us to have to not have to, but to explain and be very, very laser focused on the stewardship of those dollars to produce the highest ROI um, possible, whether that be engagement with the patients that we serve or you know, on Capitol Hill or advocacy, advocating for Medicaid expansion in a specific state. Um, it's, it's really focused us to um, produce that har um, highest ROI. This kind of segues nice into the next um, uh, question, which is, you know, we've all, of course, talked about, um, you know, moving things virtual, moving experiences virtual, um, having discussions virtually, but how else has your business model really changed? And do you think that's um, sustainable for the future? Uh, Brian? Yeah, I, I'm sorry to sort of beat an old horse here, but, I, you know, we, we saw this as an opportunity to create something that, um, you know, the patient community and the caregiver community were, in, were interested in. Um, they saw this as a time that they were likely to be home. Um, and so we, you know, we set a really low goal of about 50 participants, um, you know, and we ended up with about 120, 135 that signed up. So, you know, we were surprised. Um, and like, I think a lot of us, we, we were creating opportunities and um, can't complain that this, I think will continue into next year and the year after. And we probably have more people that are participating now as a result, right? That have never participated before in, in district days or meetings on, with uh, elected officials. Yeah, and we, we actually reached out to other kidney cancer organizations and said, you know, why don't, you, why don't we create some mutual asks that we can all agree on, and then you go out to your networks. And so we, you know, we're able to have this coalition built, and I think that's sort of an emblem of what's gone on here during this, this pandemic. Absolutely. Michael? Yeah, I mean, I, I go back to the community piece as well, but I think uh, the way that we've really pivoted just in, in general is I think about our conference, which we've never heard, uh, held virtually before, um, our gala we've never uh, held virtually before. And so just tangentially, you know, both of those events will have thousands of people in attendance, whereas normally you have at our, at our in-person conference about three, 400 people, right? So we've doubled, tripled attendance. So exactly what you're saying, Erica and Brian, I mean, I think that's really important. People have never been able to be offered these services, this education, this community, et cetera. The one thing I would just say in terms of kind of like internal nonprofit speak that has really changed is I do think long-term the peer-to-peer -peer world will, it will be, at least in my opinion, changed. Um, and so does that mean there'll be less walks? Don't know yet. Does that mean there'll be more virtual things? Uh, you know, who knows? Are there going to be more apps? I have a feeling. Um, so I, I think it's, um, it, it has been really good for us because, you know, we were probably like a C in the peer-to-peer the -peer game per se amongst nonprofits. And this gives our organization and I think the colorectal cancer space an opportunity to kind of come out of this maybe uh, as it be, it, a be in the peer-to-peer -peer game, if that makes any sense. So we certainly are, are tr trying to figure out how can we reset around making sure we meet people where they are via peer-to-peer. -peer. That's fantastic. Annette, how have um, you all changed your business model? I think that we, we definitely have, but I think that the biggest key that, and the core to our mission is, you know, that more than 115 years, the American lung Association, Americans have trusted us to help protect their lungs, whether it's researching new treatments, cures for lung disease, keeping kids off tobacco, um, or advocating for laws that protect the, airs that they, the air that they breathe. I mean, I think 
we stay true to our mission. And I think as, as uh, Michael and Brian have said is, it has given a broader base of people to really understand what the American Lung Association can do for them. Um, and, you know, we, we do have the unique pleasure to have millions or thousands of Americans to, to learn more about the programs that we serve and how we can help them. And I think that we have stride, you know, con continue to remain very true to the fact that this is COVID-19, the pandemic and how to prevent it and how to, how to be good um, citizens and, and, you know, wear a mask, social distancing. It's not a political conversation with us and with all, a lot of the other organizations. They know that they can come to us for trusted information and we're not gonna, we don't have any other agenda other than to help protect their health. So I think that how it's changed our business model, I think it helps us reinforce what, why we're here and what we can do not only with um, our lung disease patients, but with our colleagues and other organizations, how we can collaborate together. And I know one of my, um, one of our lung disease patients, you know, they, she has lung cancer and she never really could go to expos and go to events because she, because of her health. Now she gets to, and she was so tickled the other day because we do have monthly town hall, um, COVID-19 town hall meetings. And there was a professor from Harvard and she was like, I never thought. Uh-oh. But I'd hear, you know, words from a professor from Harvard. So it's giving them a unique, a unique, um, you know, individuals they may never have talked to before. So, absolutely, I'll share from our perspective at our affiliate. Um, you know, I I've used this as a moment to really um, get our organization to be known in our community less about an event and more about the impact and the um, solution we're trying to achieve, which is to end breast cancer forever. And the ultimate goal is to intentionally go out of business because we've achieved our mission. And so we've been able to, and I've looked at this as a moment and an opportunity to really shift the conversation and dive into some um, somewhat uncomfortable issues. Um, you know, we've, we've been able to start to shift our work to, um, you know, if, if, we're, if our mission is to end breast cancer forever, the only way we can do that is to have equity in the health of our community. And so prioritizing the notion of health equity, well, how do you actually make a difference in health equity? It's not just, you know, hire a diversity and inclusion officer or have a department, but understand that it begins further upstream from a, um, you know, political perspective, political determinants of health, rather than just, you know, focusing on what the uh, social determinants of health are. And so I've been really thankful for this moment and opportunity as stressful as COVID has been and heartbreaking and horrific um, to a lot of people. Um, I'm thankful for the opportunity to be able to shift the conversation and our strategic priority focus, at least in our region. Um, so shifting as um, leaders of your organizations, what have you learned the most? Annette, let's go with you first. I'm sorry. Um, you know, what we've learned the most is I think um, the value of the amazing staff that we have and the value of um, our, our local leadership and the fact that, you know, we are here to support the, the millions of lung disease patients. But we're really here as as not only employees of the Lung Association, but as human beings as well, you know, and we and we the value of having the conversations and connecting with our um, with the legislators, connecting with our staff, and um, connecting with our volunteers has really been critical to help reinforce that we're here. We are the trusted champion for them um, to come and get the resources that they need. And you know, especially during these trying times with the political and the and just so much in our world right now, is we want to continue to be that voice of science-based information and know that they can come to us with. The information that they that needs to help them get through this pandemic. Michael. Yeah, I mean, I remember. I think it was the second month, maybe April, late April, early May. A young woman from from New York was on one of our task force calls, and I was just kind of listening in, just to kind of learn and again listen. And of course, I had thought about, okay, you know, if my grandparents were no longer alive or my parents, I guess, have gotten sick and had to stay by themselves, what that would be like, uh, RA COVID diagnosis. But I think cancer patients more than anybody are already fearful, are already upset, are already going through isolation, et cetera. And it just hit me like a ton of bricks that they weren't worried about dying of cancer anymore. They were worried about dying of COVID and being alone. And I think just 
hearing that from the beginning of the pandemic really steered us to exactly what Annette was saying, all those things as an organization, as a staff, as people, et cetera. And I just, it still breaks my heart, like reading every one of those posts around people having to be alone um, during the end of their life. So I think it just brings, you know, it brought new, new, even more meaning, even though I lost my mom to colorectal cancer, brought more meaning to me about what it is to do this type of work. Absolutely. Absolutely. Brian. Yeah, thank you. I, you know, I, I'm sorry about that. That was a technical difficulty in my office. Um, so um, just to- It's par for the course for 2020, right? <laughs> it's like, like there's a ghost here. Um, so, you know, I, I just think with the fear and uncertainty that started, you know, in March with what was going on and, and all of our lives changed, you know, over the first few weeks, it seemed like. Um, you know, the resiliency that you see, um, the power of humans to overcome, to sort of set, set that aside. I, I've got it, you know, you have a cancer diagnosis or your, your family, someone in your family does, and you say, you know what, we, we still have the, we still have to live, we still have to move forward. And, and that, that's what I learned a lot about is the, the passion out there, the people that are involved in this, they're resilient. We're going to overcome this. Um, there are some tough times, but at the end of the day, I think our organizations hopefully are all giving hope to those out there. And I think that's the message that, and what I learned a lot uh, in 2020. I completely echo everything um, that you all have said, um, understanding and seeing really the resilience of our community and the patients and survivors that we all serve um, is pretty incredible and very uplifting every day. Um, one other thing that I think I've learned is how crucial each of the work that we do will be for the future. Um, knowing what's forthcoming, knowing, um, you know, the impact that COVID has had on um, the cancer space and uh, on research funding and kind of just everything. I, I see the work that we do being much more crucial uh, moving forward um, probably than ever before, just because um, we've got a lot of work to do, a lot of people to help, and so many people are counting on each of us to achieve, you know, great things uh, for them. Um, kind of closing out our discussion today, I have one final question for each of you. Um, looking to the future, what does it look like for your organizations? Are you hopeful? Are you scared? Are you re-energized? I think I know the answer each of you are going to give, but um, I'll ask each of you to speak. Annette, let's start with you. Um, I, I think if anything that we've learned about hope and resilience and, you know, we are very excited for this new territory that we have because it has opened up a lot of opportunities. I think that, um, as we mentioned, a lot of our partners, our industry partners, you know, we do a ton of um, advocacy work in each state through a lot of public um, uh, state department of health. Um, and, you know, our relationships have only gotten stronger because they everybody's has been affected by the pandemic. So we're very hopeful and, and we, we continue to go stronger as an organization and, and really look forward to how we can reinvent ourselves and reinvent um, the work that we do. And I think keeping true to keeping in touch with the, those with lung disease and letting them know who we are and, and we're here for them. Has anything come to light um, during all of this from the kind of lung space um, that wasn't quite a priority before, but you've discovered, and sorry for the one-off question, oh, no, um, no, no. that you've discovered as now a, a big priority for the future? You know, one thing that, um, not that we didn't address it, but mental health was not necessarily a, a key prior, a key imperative. But in all the work that we do, and especially now more than ever, you know, the, the, the mental toll that it takes on a lung disease patient or a lung cancer patient, not only on, on them, but on their family members, but now because of the pandemic, that extends beyond just the, the husband and the wife or the, you know, the immediate family. And I think that having an appreciation for it's okay not to be okay. And it's okay to, you know, um, reach out and talk to people and really have those sometimes uncomfortable conversations of how, you know, what's wrong, how can we help you? And, and it really is, I think, just that human connection. So I think that the mental health piece is really putting all of the big umbrella of what people are dealing with, um, not only um, patients, but staff, you know, your employees. And, and that's, that's something that's very critical that we're gonna take away and weave into that. Absolutely. It's almost as if the pandemic has forced us all to be a bit more human again, getting back to the humanity of 
Um, as each of you kind of expressed during um, almost every question we talked about, um, the notion of getting back to humanity and how important mm -hmm. those connections are. Michael, same two questions for you. Yeah, so uh, I'm sick of fear. I mean, I think just, and I think a lot of us are. Uh, every day we wake up in the news and there's, whether it's political or racial or wildfires or hurricanes or the pandemic, or I mean, we could probably keep going, right? <laughs> just a, a lot, it, you know, and so I'm incredibly hopeful for our organization, for the cause, you know, I also think one thing that we haven't really talked about is just broadly, um, you know, research and development. So we've been hearing about the this warp speed trying to get to a vaccine for COVID-19. Well, hopefully the American people and others will now see more value in the research and development that pharmaceutical and our industry partners do every single day to bring life-saving treatments to people that we love. So I think that's more hope. Um, you know, as my CEO would say, Michael, you can't be all hopeful and all, you know, rainbows and unicorns. So we have to be, of course, um, ingrained in the reality that we are in a pandemic. And that we do, as Annette and Brian both said, our patients and their families are our first priority in, in keeping them safe. So yes, being hopeful and looking for opportunities and possibilities, but making sure we're also keeping them safe as well. Absolutely. Brian, what about from your perspective? Yeah, I, I mean, I think I, I'm not going to say a whole lot that Annette and Michael haven't already said. Um, one of the things I think is we probably wouldn't be in this business if we, you know, if we weren't half glass full of folks thinking that we are going to put ourselves out of business, hopefully someday. Um, you know, I, I think a couple of things that I wanted to highlight, which Michael, you just said, you know, the speed that, that the warp speed to clinical trials for the pandemic, I think that has raised awareness. And I'm hopeful that there's some silver linings out of that that can come forward. I know we have to stay true to science, but at the same time, the speed to sort of cut through some of the red tape and other things I think is, is a good sign. Um, you know, I think the impact that this pandemic has had on the question of preparation, I, I won't go there, but I think we, we as a country and as, as a globe, we're gonna start thinking about bigger things. That, that's another good thing, I think. And I think just sort of the focus on some of the non-scientific data like or, or non-scientific issues like quality of life, patient reported outcomes, those kinds of things that may have been not taking a priority in discussions is now being seen more now that we have telemedicine and patients are reporting things. So there, I think there's the future's bright, I, I believe. I couldn't agree more. I, I think it's an interesting time to be leading a uh, for, and again, I don't like the term not-for-profit, for impact organization that, um, um, you know, we're in a moment where we've all had to totally shift our business model, our engagement strategies, the way we work with our communities and support um, you know, the, the patients that we serve. And I think that's an exciting time because um, we haven't had a disruption for a while, um, actually thankfully, but sometimes disruption is needed in order to really make progress. And I'm hopeful that, that this is that moment for all of us in working forward, um, you know, to hopefully intentionally go out of business because we have achieved each of our missions. Um, I just wanna thank each of you for participating and en engaging in such a great conversation. It's nice to um, share in the, um, you know, the space of uh, for impact work that we do in the communities that we serve. And I think we collectively um, can agree that Collectively, we're much stronger um, as a group and can make some great progress, both in research and the patients that we serve. And, um, you know, and hopefully, um, you know, I, I look forward to coming together again at some point, hopefully in person um, and continue the conversation about reinventing the work that we do and how can we collaborate to make some great progress. So thank you so much for your, your time today. Thank you. Thank you, Erica.